from the Providence College class of 1968 back to his alma mater. He is here tonight to speak about some valuable lessons he has learned as a successful entrepreneur, political activist, documentary film producer, and small business advisor and advocate. Dahl has learned numerous business lessons dating back to his time selling Catholic school raffle tickets at age eight by tar targeting happy hour bar flies. Throughout his undergraduate years here at PC, graduate years at Harvard Business School, and postgraduate years in California, Mr. LaMagna earned his real world business chops in a string of failed enterprises. His luck finally turned around with a small eyebrow tweezer company named Tweezer Man that he sold in 2004 to a German firm for, firm for millions of dollars. Mr. LaMagna tried his hand in politics by running for Congress twice in New York and had a brief presidential run in 2008 on the platform of ending the Iraqi war. Later, he risked his own life by traveling to Iraq by bringing together eight insurgent groups and 18 tribal leaders to sign a ceasefire on the condition that the US would agree to eventually withdraw from the country. Many of you remember Emmanuel Jal, the Su uh, Sudanese ch child soldier turned rap star that BOP brought here two years ago. Mr. Lomagna had a hand in Emma Emmanuel's fame by producing his documentary of his life. Today, Mr. Lomagna blogs for the Huffington Post is an active trustee of the Bainbridge Gradu Graduate Institute, which awards MBAs in sustainable business. He's also currently promoting his new uh, memoir entitled Raising Eyebrows, A Failed Entrepreneur Finally Gets It Right. We're actually gonna be selling a few copies in the back um, afterward if you'd like uh, Mr. Lamagna to sign one. Dahl's book is fun and a quick read that shows how courageous he is through all of his failed business ventures. He has been featured on MSNBC's The Dylan Radigan Show, Small Biz Business Advocate Show, and America's Morning News. He's an example of a man who has the fortitude to pursue his dreams and passions without letting fe fear or failure get in his way. It is now my great pr pleasure to introduce Mr. Dalamanya. Thank you, Kevin. Didn't know who I was. Back in, I was a sophomore at Providence College. I think that was 1965. And I wanted to be a physics person. I wanted to figure out how to use gravity, save money, change the world. But I didn't want to be a starving physicist. And I had read that Voltaire, the novelist, had taken two or three years away from his life to do a real estate deal, and he made himself independently wealthy, and he was able to spend the rest of his life pursuing his art. So I decided right then and there, I was gonna become a millionaire, do it as fast as possible, so that I could get back to my real passion in life, which was to be a physicist. So, <laughs> there I am, a sophomore at college, kind of come up with ideas, and Joe Broom, Joe, Joe's here, Joe is a classmate of mine, and uh, we, uh, uh, <laughs> we organized a student day of sport. And I, I said, uh, and during, after that was successful and we worked well together, I said, Joe, during the, during the break, the Christmas break, why don't we run a mixer, a dances for the, all the students who are coming back to Providence. Let's do this so that they can meet each other and we can make some money. So we would uh, uh, find a hall in Providence, promoted, well, we get some money from, we borrowed some money from Chris Dodd, who was our classmate back then, who became Senator Dodd. We had $400, we hired a band, and then uh, Joe was the publicist, and that was his job. Well, we couldn't get a hole, <laughs> because no one wants thousands of college students in their neighborhood or in their hall, and we kept getting pushed out further and further, and we finally decided, did it in Taunton, Massachusetts, and we called it Christmas College Capers. So right there, the problems begin. <laughs> because people have to get out to Taunton to go to this dance, if they have heard about it. So the beginning of my problem started the night of the dance when we got 26 inches of snow. The only person to show up was my lab partner. Joe couldn't even make it because he didn't have snow tires on his car. The band showed up, and uh, the police showed up, the six policemen. They felt sorry for me, so they didn't charge me. Well, that was a bust. And uh, I borrowed money from my father 
to pay back Senator, soon to be Senator Dodd, and that was the beginning of my, my career. Well, things didn't end there. What, what came up next for me, uh, and I'm going to read this from my book. Uh, Father Shannon here is in the audience, and I know he has to leave a little earlier, but I, so I really want him to hear this story and thank yourself that you weren't here for the story. <laughs> so this is all about getting free publicity, and it's all about really being innovative. Uh, I was one of the uh, originators of computerized dating back in 1965. And Peter Gavirsch, who is a, a physics major attending the school on a full academic scholarship, he was a senior and substitute teacher for my physics professor. I was a sophomore. I'd never spoken to him until the day we were both waiting to see the dean. Peter sat absolutely motionless on a leather chair across from me. He looked like he had a current of electricity running through his hair and his body. So his hair wasn't really hair at all, but antenna pointing at some invisible magic field over his head. The dean had not invited us in for tea and crumpets. Our meeting concerned disciplinary action. I was there for rolling a bowling ball down the marble floor of Aquinas Hall, into the student monitor's solid wood door in the middle of the night. Now, you might wonder, how did they know it was me? Well, what happened, I, my roommate and I, Paul Kuznets, after I rolled the ball down, you can hear it. Vroom, vroom, vroom. You know, Aquinas Hall, how long it is, and the door was open in the middle, and the, and the wooden doors all at the end. I'd gotten the ball from the local bowling alley. Vroom, vroom, vroom. Crash. So and we jumped into our beds, put the covers over our thing, and you know, we're kind of laughing. There's a knock on our door. So I get up and kind of sleepy and walk over and go uh, uh, and I open the door, and there's the priest who was in charge of the dorm and the student professor. Okay, Lamagna, we know it's you. And I look, what, 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 what? Well, every single student on that hall was outside his room looking to see what had happened, except me and Kuznets. We were in bed. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, there we were. Peter was there for cutting classes. Dull and ultimately meaningless was how Peter put it. Our meeting with the dean didn't amount to much. I had to return the ball to the local bowling alley, and Peter promised to be more engaged in the classroom experience. As we walked back to our respective dormitories, Peter told me he was in charge of the school's sole computer. I told him I had always wanted to see one up close. I was envisioning the science fiction movies of the 50s with computer-run robots wrecking havoc throughout the world. Peter was amused by my interest, but told me I'd be disappointed once I saw the real thing. To Peter's surprise, I was not disappointed at all. The IBM 601 was housed in a large alcove outside the physics lab. The 601 was really just a large tabulator about the size of a combination washer-dryer. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration had stopped using them almost a decade earlier and had donated this one to the college. It had about 1,000 vacuum tubes with a total of 40,000 bits of memory. A modern laptop has billions of times that much. It was very clunky looking and required a lot of human input on punch cards. If you remember those, those are my classmates here, to give the result. Peter kept it well oiled and immaculate. He put some punch cards into a carry stop and then ran it for me. I said, have you ever heard of Operation Match? You mean those guys from Harvard, said Peter? Yeah, they're making a killing putting college kids together by computer. And they were really, literally the first ones to do that. Do you think you can do that? Absolutely. We called our company Cupid Computer. And uh, let's see if I can pull that one up. Is it up there? Open it up. There you go. Cupid computer. <laughs> the logo is a drawing of Cupid holding his love bow and arrow. We devised a questionnaire in which people described themselves and what they were looking for in a date. It was the usual, height, age, education, hobbies. We also include some questions about premarital sex. We didn't want to match a woman who had never had sex to a guy who assumed premarital sex was a given. We required people to sign their questionnaires. Peter claimed to know enough about handwriting analysis to detect liars. 
I was looking for some free advertising now, and I went to pitch the idea to Al Horowitz, the promotion manager for WPRO Radio in Providence. He said if there was an event, he could promote it. We decided to have a dance where everyone could meet his or her day. So we rented the grand ballroom of the Sheridan Biltmore Hotel, the biggest hotel in Providence at the time. I hired the Rhode Island family band, the Cow Sills. I don't know if any of you know who they are, but they became international hit sensations. Uh, they were, would have been the Partridge family. Al lived up to his promise. Free spots ran all day long for a week promoting Cupid Computer. Peter and I were interviewed at a local TV station. When the reporter asked us how many people had signed up on cue, Peter unfolded along the floor a list, of, an endless list of respondents. We looked like the biggest event in town. On the night of the dance, 500 people showed up. In the upper lobby, we had a bulletin board titled, Who is Your Day? Where we listed all the matches. Everyone wore a name tag, and you had to go and find your date. As the crowd around the bulletin board thinned out, there were maybe 60 people still there, stuck without dates. Peter and I surmised that what had happened was that some people had seen their computer match and hightailed it out of there, <laughs> or just removed their name tags and got lost in the crowd. Unfortunately, this happened to Peter. I told him his date probably never did probably show up at all, but there was no way of knowing for sure, no time for personal remorse, because now we had 60 very angry people on our hands. I climbed onto the top of the table to address them. The last thing I could tell them was the obvious, which was that their dates had probably taken one look at them and run for the exits. It's getting late, and your dates haven't arrived. Why don't all you just intermingle so the night won't be a loss, the councils are playing, the music is great. From the rear of the lobby, a rather imposing woman with the build of a modern day linebacker yelled, I want my money back. I began to hem and whore and because most of the money was gone. <laughs> it was amazing how much money you set, spent setting up a dance. We want our money back, others chanted. Suddenly, the large woman in the rear started pushing in my direction. I saw the crowd growing ugly and decided to make a quick exit. I turned around, jumped to the windowsill behind the table, opened the window, and climbed out onto the fire escape. I then ran down the fire escape to the window of the floor below where the dance was taking place, jumped in, and got lost in the crowd. The next day, the Providence Journal ran a two-page centerfold story by a reporter who was one of our dates who hadn't shown up. It was entitled, I was stood up by Cupid Computer. The article encouraged me, actually. <laughs> Double-page spread, centerfold. I'd read somewhere that any publicity, even bad publicity, was good. I showed the article to Peter in hopes of cheering him up. Hey, great publicity, huh? By that measure, the Titanic sinks would be good publicity, Peter said. Of course, he was right. We hadn't made any money. The worst was yet to come. Our questionnaire required you to be attending college. High school girls beat our screening process. Some of their parents had seen our questionnaire. They were not pleased. Two questions in particular they found very disturbing. Question number 13 asked about sexual experience. The multiple choice answers were very little, less than average, above average, or great. <laughs> then there was question number 15, which sought to poll viewpoints on premarital sex, with three possible answers being never permissible with a deep, meaningful relationship and whatever I can. I must take full responsibility for the inclusion of wherever I can. I was 19 years old. There were no students, no women on campus back then. And one thing I didn't know for sure, that's what I wanted to do whenever I could. Well, the problem was that the return address for the completed questionnaire was my post office box at Providence College. The parents assumed that this dance, as well as the questionnaire, was sponsored and therefore by proxy, condoned by Providence College. You know, Providence College, being a Catholic school run by Dominican priests, setting up sexual encounters for high school girls was not part of the mission statement. <laughs> the parents of these girls went directly to the Diocese of Providence with their complaints. The Bishop of Providence, His Eminence Bishop Russell McVinney, immediately called Reverend Vincent Dorr, the president of the college. He, in turn, wanted to convene a special meeting of the Board of Discipline to deal with these allegations, and if heads must roll, so be it. 
They had some questions with Peter in mind. I know you probably have not thought much about the Spanish Inquisition lately, but I can attest to the fact that it existed in all its rabbit splendor the day of our hearing. It was precisely at the stroke of 8 o'clock the following morning that the proceedings began. Seven Dominican priests in long flowing white robes sat in carved wooden straight back chairs around a horse shaped, shoe shaped table. Peter and I sat in the middle, a chandelier with fake candles dangling precariously above our heads. Lay teachers and lesser priests sat on either side. The whole place smelled of burnt twigs, which brought to mind Joan of Arc at the stake. A wheelchair pushed by a young novitiate came to a squeaking halt several feet from us. Seated in the wheelchair was a fragile, twisted body of an old priest. His eyes were fixed in a perpetual, perpetual squint, or maybe they were closed, because Peter and I later decided he was dozing off most of the time. I had no idea who he was, and I still, still don't. The dean of discipline, a priest, placed the folder on the table, opened it, and scanned the room like a young Perry Mason. We're here today to determine the guilt or innocence of Dominic Anthony Lamagna and Peter Gavush. The allegations are that these two students of Providence College engaged in the illegal use of the college's computer. They used said computer to obtain information of extreme personal nature regarding young women living on and off campus. It is the position of the persecutional arm of the Board of Discipline that the information was gathered on the false pretexts to determine some young women's sexual preferences. This was the most ridiculous mumbo jumbo I'd ever heard. I was scared shitless. <laughs> Father Smith, who was in charge of the computer room, stood up and denied any knowledge of what we were doing, even though he had given us permission. Nor did I give them permission to sneak into the facility at night. He was right about that. But we had our deadlines to meet and didn't think ourselves as sneaking into the facility when the windows were open. As the Inquisition rambled on, it became obvious that the Board of Discipline was of two minds. One side was concerned by the questionable questions in the questionnaire. The other group, the younger priests, were almost exclusively concerned with the sex-addled, money-hungry, degenerate students sitting smugly before them. Peter and I sensed that division and spoke honestly and almost exclusively to the questionable questions group. I think we were persuasive that it was more a case of poor judgment, coupled with immaturity, than any premeditation on our parts. For the second group, frustration was running high because it was obvious there was no culpable evidence. Then Father Kern, name changed to protect the guilty. A short priest with a frightened eye stood up. He asked me who I thought I was. I didn't know how to answer that question. I didn't even try. He rushed towards me in a sudden rage, pushing chairs aside. What do you want? Sorry? What? You must want something. We all want something. I knew the answer but was sure my answer would enrage him even more. I felt certain my desires would be contrary to what his might be. Somehow I couldn't imagine Father Curran wanting money or a car or a certain array of merchandise or wanting the world's esteem. I could not imagine him wanting anything as much as I wanted these things. All I could imagine was his contempt. What will Mr. Lamagna do upon graduation? Be a promoter? He said promoter like the thought was so disgusting he could not wait to fling it from his mouth. Was he trying to do save me? From what? From being a promoter? To accept Father Kern's hope of redemption, I would have to give up my own. He believed in God, I believed in the world. I hesitated a moment, then finally spoke. Yes, yes, I'll probably be a promoter. I'll probably be a millionaire too. And despite the way I'm being treated here, I will still contribute to the school. <laughs> well. The collective silence room was deafening. The old priest in the wheelchair whispered something to the young novitiate who whispered it to the priest besides him. Down the aisle I went until finally it got to the dean of discipline who stepped forward in a booming voice, made an announcement to the room. Enough. This review is over. So here I am. It's 44 years later. <laughs> I did happen to make that million dollars. And I'm here tonight to make good on my promise Father Stanley, come up and accept this check <laughs> from, the, from the, that promoter <laughs> that you've trained so well. <laughs> this is a check for $25,000. Thank you very much. That's his. <laughs> but there's more for me in that check. I feel so embarrassed that, you know, since I sold my company, Tweezer Man, and made millions, but I haven't made much of contributions to the school.
So I am pledging to give you, the school, $25,000 for the next 10 years. Thank you this very year. much. We appreciate that. Very much. That's great. Yeah. So you know, I want to I want to show you guys uh, this uh, experience in this book, and I want to show you a little trailer that I uh, that we produced that tells us a little story. So why don't we run this? I opened up an ice cream parlor called Beelzebub's with Harvey and Marilyn Diamond on the beach in Venice. And we had... Go back to the beginning. Now, uh, just to explain something about this. These days, when you, when you write a book, how do you get it out? Well, one of the things you do is you produce a book sale, uh, which is hopefully going to convince people to send it to their friends and give away all so we'll, we can figure out how to turn the lights off. We'll, we'll run this. All right, good, terrific. I opened up an ice cream parlor called Beelzebub's with Harvey and Marilyn Diamond on the beach at Venice. And we had gotten to the point where we were doing pretty well, and, but we hadn't finalized the lease with the landlord. I wanted to be able to roller skate into one door buy your ice cream and roller skate out another door so the traffic would flow through. That required us to have to open up a door on the right side of the building. So I went with my leases to Werner Schaff, who was the landlord in Beverly Hills, and I was driving my 19 whatever it was Ford Falcon. It was really not a Beverly Hills car. When I pulled it to his office, I didn't want to give it to the valet because I was embarrassed about my car, so I drove my car into the back of the lot and hit it. So we're sitting there, and Mr. Brown, who sits behind his bodyguard, is sitting behind him. So he's signing the leases. But I wanted to ask Ver Werner if he would give us an $800 rent credit so that I could f open up that door. He said, why would I want to do that? If you put that door in, I need $800 more in deposit because I may not want that door when you leave. It's a 10-year lease. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So looking at him, I reached over, I grabbed the leases, and ran. And got out. And he screams, get the leases, to, to Mr. Brown. So I'm running down the halls, running, and I, I ran down the steps, and I can hear them running after me, and I ran outside to uh, the, the parking lot and hide. They're talking to the valets, and I'm seeing them, so I crawl over to my car, and I get into my car, because it's in the back, and I start the engine up. I don't have a muffler, so... <laughs> and I'm driving out of the parking lot, and Werner runs out into the street and stands in front of me. So he's got me. And then he comes around to the door, opens the door, and tries to grab the keys to my car. And I grab the keys to my car. And instead, he grabs my, my briefcase and, and walks away. This is weren't in the briefcase. The leases were you know, on the floor. So I take the leases. I get up. I open up the trunk. I throw them in the trunk. I lock the trunk, jump in the car, and I drive, I drive home. Back to Venice with the leases, thinking, what the hell did I just do? <laughs> well, you can imagine how my partners felt when I came back <laughs> with no leases. In fact, with the leases, but not, sign not signed by me. It turned out that, uh, let's just see, just going to give this to you here right from the book here. So, you know, I ran out of Werner Sharp's office with the leases. Uh, uh, and there was a getaway, and, and you know, we struggled and all that. So uh, what were the pluses and minuses here? Well, uh, we had $4,800 invested in the building where we were putting this ice cream parlor, and we didn't have a lease. That was one. No two minuses. People normally, normally people don't renovate spaces until they have a lease. 
and Werner Schaff was definitely very angry at me. And this was probably the end of our business relationship, a relationship that from the get-go, I might add, wasn't very promising. So this could be a plus. Now we have the opportunity to move the store to another location, a better location, one that could be bigger, or even skater friendly, a definite plus. But we have no money. That's the big minus. The last thought seemed to send me into a brief spiral of despair. I said brief because I started leafing through the leases, and I quickly noticed that he had signed the leases. No wonder he was willing to put his life in jeopardy to get them. I had signed leases. Werner Schaaf had nothing. We had all the power. The only way he could evict us from the store would be our failure to pay the rent. And that's what exactly what I planned to do. I would take him, it would take him six months to evict us. Six months, I quickly calculated, would amount to $4,800, precisely the amount of our investment, and so on and so forth. Well, my partners weren't very happy about all this because Werner had called them. He also was their landlord and was evicting them from their apartment. And they had just found out that they had a child, so they were freaked out. And finally, what happened was they convinced me to go in with them to see Werner. And uh, I went along and cheapishly sat down. And I could tell that Werner liked me. He loved the fact that somebody got him out of his chair and had him running down the hall and into the street in Beverly Hills chasing this guy in a beat up Bout Falcon. So it all worked out. And uh, we, we were able to open up our, our ice cream parlor. The, you know, what, what, what what happens when you're out there working on the edge of life all the time? You're a guy like me, you don't have any money. You're creating these ideas, these businesses that you know, really are a struggle to create. And you're, you're trying, you're trying to, to, to make it and you run into unreasonable people and you kind of lose it. So I learned my lesson there to not be so crazy about things and, and calm down. I thought it would be useful actually for everyone if you, you care. How many people here considered starting their own business? Okay, enough people. Or know someone who considered starting a business. I, I, think, I, you know, I think it would be interesting for you to hear you know, uh, from me uh, basically my, my viewpoint on this. First of all, I, I think that America right now, the American economy, is held hostage by the people who control these large corporations and use these large corporations as their personal ATM machines. They'll lay people off so they can get a bonus. They'll, these comp corporations will come into communities and put up a big box store and take the money out of the community. They'll operate a, a mailbox in the Cayman Islands so they don't have to pay US taxes. And Americans, are onto this now. We just went through this incredible crisis when the banks were failing, and we had to bail them out as taxpayers. And now the banks are starting to talk about charging us for our checking accounts. A revolution is about to happen. And this revolution, in my opinion, is going to be small business people are going to take back our economy from these large corporations. And the American people are going to want to do business with their neighbors. So it's a great time now to be starting a business, your own business. Even if you're in college now, you can have a business. I know there's, there's people in this college right now who do have businesses. And I think it, it'd be useful for me to talk a little bit about you know, how to go about this. First of all, I would not fear failure. I would fear success. Because you've got to think through your, what's going to happen with your crazy idea if you succeed. You've got to make sure you want that life. I got involved in this restaurant, which was failing. I became a partner, and I jumped into it. And three or four months later, it was successful, and we started to do a lot of business. I was working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. I hated it. So I, I quit. I wasted nine months of my life. I didn't think through the consequences. So when you're thinking about if you want to start a business, what you're going to do, think about what kind of life you want to have. Do you want to work on a computer? Do you want to work on, on the road? Do you want to manage people? Do you want to be alone? Go through that exercise, and you'll eliminate a lot of things that you normally might have done because you just get so excited about the ideas. Once you've decided what it is that you want to do, the most important thing that you need to do as a business person is be organized. If you're not organized, don't start a business. Go find someone else who started a business and work with them. That is what a person who runs a business is doing all the time, is organizing. Organizing themselves, organizing their business. 
We can talk about that at length of how to be organized. Like one exercise you can do to become an organized person. And I don't think that organized, being organized is something you're born with. Some people pick it up from their parents, and some people are just that way. But you have to intentionally work at being organized to be organized. For instance, is never be late for something. Don't be early, don't be late. That one principle will teach you how to organize, because you've got to be organized to get to a place on time. In my case, you also have to go through some red lights. So now that you're organized, then the next thing I urge you to do is to be focused. Because if you're the entrepreneurial type, you're going to get a lot of ideas. And the next thing you know, you start something. And the next thing you know, you think of something else, and you lose your focus. I, when I finally succeeded with Tweezer Man, I was very focused on just selling tweezers. I had one tweezer, and that's all I sold. And when I got to the point where I was successful, I was thinking, well, how can I focus even more? How can I grow more? And the question is, do I sell tweezers now to dentists, or do I sell a tweezer to uh, in industry? Because the industry uses tweezers. And I realized that I was selling my one tweezer to a 1,000 places that sold beauty tools. So the principal focus, instead of my next product was not another tweezer. My next product was a nail clipper, which fitted the line. And then the tweezer man grew into a company that basically uh, sold uh, personal care tools. You might be interested in how I, after all my failures, came to the, uh, the idea of a tweezer man. And that is, uh, I won't read that story because it goes on, but I'll tell it to you quickly. I uh, was living in Venice Beach, California, trying to be a movie producer. I, that wasn't working out too well. Uh, and I found myself one day with my butt covered with splinters. Uh, you can read how I got those splinters in the book. I was bent over looking into a mirror between my legs. I had a tweezer in one hand, a needle in the other hand, and I'm trying to coordinate this two-handed action, and they were red with splinters, and I had to get them out, and I couldn't. And I thought, gee, I wish this tweezer was a needle. Well, of course, there must be someone who sells that, so I ran into town to the drugstore and looking for a needle-pointed tweezer. We sell needles, we sell tweezers, we don't have needle pointed tweezers. I went to the lumber yard, no luck. So I went back and the person who was involved in my getting those splinters took them out for me and there were 32 splinters. Now flash forward, I've given up trying to be, you know, to take a break from being an entrepreneur. I mean, I'm 32 years old and I'm $150,000 in debt and I'm thinking there's a tragic floor here Something's wrong with me. I better take a break. So I go home to Long Island. I live with my sister and my mother and borrow my sister's bike and find a job within reach of the bike, which was an electronics company, the only job I ever had. And the electronics company, once I got in there, I worked for minimum wage. They were picking up capacitors and diodes with needle-pointed tweezers that were made in Italy. And it was exactly what I imagined the, the, the tweezers sh should be. So. I bought the tweezers uh, from the purchasing manager and packaged it as splinter tweezers and went around the lumber yards and hardware stores to sell them splinter tweezers so they can sell them to their customers. And they sold, but n not enough to really make a living at it. A woman said to me, get me a good eyebrow tweezer and I can sell them to my clients in my beauty salon. So I went to the same supplier who made this tweezer and there was a diamond tweezer that was pointed but not so sharp that you can, they picked up diamonds with that I was able to sell as a precision eyebrow tweezer. I packaged it in a clear tube and went around to, I, I sold them to her, and then she started selling them, like a lot. She was selling six a week. And I figured if she can sell them in a salon, I could sell them to salons. So I then personally went around to beauty salons selling tweezers. I didn't even say who I was. I'd walk in, I'd hand them the tweezer, say, try this, you might like, like it, and I sold them. And that worked out pretty well because I was making more money on Saturday selling eyebrow tweezers than I was making all week working for that electronics company. So I quit my job, which is, by the way, advice I give to people who write to me and say, I, at my website I have this section called Ask Dow and people can ask me questions about their businesses and you're welcome to do that too. People ask me, should I quit my job and start my business? You know, what do you think I should do? And you know, I tell them what Yogi Berra says, when you come to a crossroads, take it. Do both, you know, and then if the business works out, you can drop your job. 
So I quit my job, and there I am now. I put my name on the tweezers, Yves Saint Laurent, Pierre Cardin, Dalamagna, Dalamagna Grooming. I have it engraved in tweezers, and I'm selling these precision eyebrow tweezers. And I walk into a salon that I had been in two months prior to see if they want to buy more, and the woman yells to everybody, the tweezer man is here. And that's when I changed the name of the company, the tweezer man. My, I, I, went, I did go to the Harvard Business School after Providence College, and the, uh, uh, my classmates, my marketing classmates said to me, you can't call it tweezer man, that's ridiculous. It's a serious product. It should have a German sounding name like Hoffritz or Zwilling or something like that. And I stuck with tweezer man, and that was a great move because the, the brand really stuck. Who, you know, when you, who are you going to call when you need a tweezer? You call tweezer man. And so bringing up Harvard, uh, I, when I graduated from PC, I was uh, 253rd in my class, and uh, I wasn't rich. And I got into Harvard Business School. In fact, I thought that it was some kind of experiment. And I asked the dean of discipline, I said, what, why did you guys accept me? And uh, he said, oh, he said, yeah, I, I remember you. Well, my application to school I listed 11 business things that I had done, deals that I started during my days at PC and, and before, and every one of them was a failure, and I explained why. He said, oh, yeah, we, we looked at your, your application, and you were the, one of the first people we took. And I said, well, why? He said, because when we read your application before, here's somewhere we can actually help. <laughs> so now, you know, my, my life stream to get to Harvard, you know, that's really I wanted to go, and I finally get in. and. Uh, I get a student loan. And back then, it cost $5,000 to go to go to the business school. So I get a student loan, and uh, $5,000, they send it to me. I get a check in the mail. Usually, you would think they would put it to your account. So I took the check, I put it in my bank account, and it's like, you know, I'm thinking. I didn't do anything with it over the summer. First day, not first day of school, but I, get, I go up to school three days before opening class, uh, and there's a guy in the room that I'm moving into who's moving out that day, and he's got this ascot on, and he's a real preppy kind of guy. And he's on the phone, he's going, Global Marine, Global Marine. Okay, thank you, yes, I'll put my sister in it, yes. And he runs past me, and I go, what's up? What's up with Global Marine? He said, they discovered gold in Alaska. GLM, Global Marine. I'm at the Harvard Business School. This is where people make money. So I jump on the phone. I call my stockbroker in New York, John Krauss, and say, John, how can I get the most amount of play for my $5,000 that I have? He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, I want to I buy that stock, but I, don't, I want to buy as much as I can. I know that you can buy stock on margin and get double the amount. He said, well, you can buy a call. A call on a stock is the right to buy the stock at a fixed price for a period of time. So for $5,000, I can control $50,000 worth of the stock, 10% of the cost of the stock. Now, what happens is you can lose all your money if in 30 days the stock doesn't move up enough for you to recover your investment. So I had $50,000 of Global Marine stock control. That's, it was selling at $50 a share. So that's 1,000 shares. So all the stock had to do is go up five points for me to make back my 5,000. And I'm thinking it's going to go to 80. I mean, they discovered gold. This is the Harvard Business School. So I was very excited. And I, I got to say something. Sometimes it's not good to be successful early. You get, you know, you get arrogant. You know? And here I am, first day of school, and I'm, I'm going to make a killing. And first day of school did come. That I got in there on Friday. So on Monday morning, there I was with my control of 1,000 shares of stock. And we didn't have cell phones back then. This was back in 68. And so I called John Krauss from my room. I said, well, you know, how's it going? It's, he said, it hasn't opened. Now, back then, the stocks had specialists who managed the, the buying and selling of stocks. Now it's all computerized. But back then, that's the way it worked. And if there were a lot of people wanting to buy a stock more than who wanted to sell it, a specialist would figure out the price that it would have to open at. So I was very excited, and so was John, because he had put his whole office into the stock. So I go to class. I couldn't think of anything but how much money I was going to I'm thinking about I'm going to be buying a car. I'm going to move off a of campus. I'm going to get a sound system. That's a lot of money. I mean, 
$30,000 back then. So I hear my, I'm going back to my room. I hear the phone ring. I'm running up the stairs. And I pick up the phone. I'm out of breath. And he goes, and John says, what's wrong? What's wrong? Why are you? I says, I just ran up the stairs. He said, are you sitting down? I said, no, no. He said, well, sit down. So I sat down. He said, we're screwed. <laughs> I said, he said, Global Marine opened up eight, $17 lower. I said, why? He said, because they found that the gold wasn't profitable to mine because it was in ice. So the first day of school, I lost my tuition. And, you know, my, my father was a fireman and a longshoreman. It wasn't like I was going to ask Daddy to, you know, come up with it. He didn't have it. There I was, blown my, my, my MBA on the spot. I freaked out. I didn't know what to do. My mother, so I walked over there on the bridge there, uh, uh, up there in Boston over the Charles River, and I'm sitting there. And thinking about my mother's advice to me. My mother used to say to me, Dal, if you lie to me, the punishment will be worse than the actual thing you did. So, all right, tell the truth. I'm thinking, tell the truth. So, next morning, I go, I sit in front of the, the financial, the dean of finances or, or the registrar's office. She walks in, I open the door for her, and sits, she sits down. She's looking at me, she says, and uh, can I help you, Mr. Lamagna? And I said, well, didn't you read my application? She said, what are you talking about? I said, don't you know I'm a compulsive capitalist? She says, and? Well, I lost my tuition in the stock market yesterday. <laughs> and she turned white. And she, why did you send me the money, I said. <laughs> well, um, I said, I'll work. She says, you can't work. This is a full-time job going to school here. So. I, I, she said, I don't know what we're going to do, Mr. Lamont. You're going to have to come back to, tomorrow. I'm going to have to talk to some people. So I had a rough night. I didn't tell my parents. And went back the next day. And she said, look, Mr. Lamont, we are going to lend you the money again. Only this time, we're not going to give it to you. We're going to put it in your account. In fact, from now on, that's what we're going to do with all student loans. So I'm probably the only guy to go through the Harvard Business School who owes the school more than the cost to go, twice as much more than the cost to go. The lesson I learned on that one was you really shouldn't be gambling. <laughs> you really risk, you know, they talk about entrepreneurs being risk takers. Yes, that's what you are. You're taking a risk. You're risking your life. You're not taking a job. But you got to, you, 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 you got to not take risk. You got to minimize your risk. And I was going through this list here of, you know, the things that I advise that you could do if, you know, you want to be an entrepreneur. And, you know, certainly, you know, I said you should be organized, you should be focused, be persistent, but not so persistent with an idea that you spend your life doing it. Another idea that I had was uh, and worked on a project that turned into a big project was a friend of mine wrote a great screenplay called Keepers of the Night. It was a gothic thrill. It was a movie. And we needed a million dollars to make this movie. And I spent eight years of my life trying to raise a million dollars for this movie. I did everything that I could do for the movie. I got cast, I got the crew, I got every, everything all lined up, but I couldn't raise a million dollars. Probably because I, at the time, was penniless and didn't even have a place to live, and I had no credibility. The only thing I had going for me was the fact that I'd gone to the Harvard Business School at that point, but back, there in, back then in Hollywood, if you had gone to the Harvard Business School, you were considered persona non grata. So you don't be so persistent that you ruin your life. The other thing is that you, when you start a business is you be frugal. Don't spend money you don't have to spend. In fact, buy everything used. These days, you got Craigslist. There's practically everything you want you can find a half price on Craigslist. Anything you buy, you know, you ask the price before you buy it, negotiate, and besides being frugal, you know, you want to keep it simple. When you finally do hire someone, hire someone who's organized, I remember when I used to hire people who would be my assistant, which is basically to do something that required them to be organized. If, if, first of all, you know, the Malcolm Gladwell test, which is 15, in 15 seconds, you can know whether or not you like a person. So that's the gut feeling. And I would work with my gut feeling. And if I liked you, then I would interview you. If I didn't like you, I would still interview, but I would just politely dis dismiss you. But if I liked you enough, I'd interview you, and then I'd follow you back to your car. If your car was messy, I wouldn't hire you. 
because I need an organized person. And organized people don't drive around in messy cars. Another thing that people do when they start business is, oh, should I have a partner? Well, no, not a partner. If you want someone else to work with, get two partners. Because the last thing you want to be involved in is a situation where you and the other person don't agree. I just finished reorganizing a, co a company that I had invested in. It's a company called Ice Stone uh, that makes countertops that are recycled glass and cement. And it's up in, it's, uh, in Brooklyn. They have in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, they have a factory. And the partners of this company were, there were two people, they were co managing partners of the company, stopped talking in 2008 when the economy collapsed, and they couldn't make decisions. In fact, what they did was they went to counseling. And they tried mediation, and they couldn't get a decision. So they came to the board. I was on the board. And they asked us to help them. And we said, well, we'll help you if you agree to allow us to ask one of you to leave. At the end of that process, uh, what we did was we appointed, we asked one person to leave. We had them both compete for, for the job. And, one, and she agreed, to, the woman who left agreed to do it. And she got severance. And the other fellow who stayed, he stayed because he was the one who was capable of raising money. And we created two other managing partners. I'm one of them, and, the, and the other, another big investor is another. So we have three people. At Tweezer Man, when I, you know, part of the thing that I did at Tweezer Man is I really empowered the employees, and the employees were very involved in running the company. We had a steering committee, and we had an executive committee. The executive committee was three people. The steering committee was always an odd number. So that's my, my say on partners. The other thing is don't raise money from people in the early stages if you, don't, if you can avoid it because you have to give up too much of your equity. That's what you call the most expensive way to raise money is to give away a piece of your company. Some people, they go out and they raise money from venture capitalists for a business idea and they end up giving away 80% of the company and they keep 20. And then four, year, four or five years later, the venture capitalists are looking for them to cash out so they can move on. It's not what you want to do if you want to build a company that is going to first support you and then maybe, hopefully, make you rich. That's not, that's not the way I would advise to go. The, uh, uh, the most important thing that I learned, because I spent so much of my time in my life with ventures that I concocted up in my mind trying to raise money. For instance, Lamagna's lasagna baking pans. These are baking pans perfectly sized to make lasagna. And I kind of, kind of see if I can. Yeah, so, you know, he, he, I left California with a small backpack and $180 to my name as I hitchhiked back, uh, hitchhiked back east. I thought about my 10th uh, year Harvard reunion, which would be coming up in a few weeks, and I wouldn't be going. Uh, I couldn't go because I couldn't afford it. And anyway, I wasn't too embarrassed to go. Most of my Harvard classmates had gone on to great success, but all I had to show for my 15-odd entrepreneurial ventures by that point was a burgeoning debt and the realization that the common thread running through all these failures was me. One of my f classmates and a close friend, Frank Sattel, told me that at the reunion, he had announced to our class that he estimated I had single-handedly brought the average income of our 700-member class down by $80 a head. I had made it $2,500 that year. And Frank used to enjoy introducing me to his friends by inverting the usual Harvard expectation. This is Dal Lamagna. By the time he's a million, he'll be worth 30 bucks. <laughs> Years later, when Frank worked for me, he, he remembered that line and, and, and reminded me that maybe he'd gotten the, to the last laugh. But so anyway, so I had gone home, and, and a series of projects kept coming up in my mind. But one of the things that uh, I did was when I, I literally had a, Backpack, four pair of underwear, two pair of pants, two pair of dungarees, two shirts, my notebook, and uh, that was it. And everything I owned was on my back, and I hitchhiked around and I stayed at friends' houses. And one of the thing that I did, one of the things that I did, was I cook when I get there so I can extend the stay. I'd be a welcome guest, and I had five meals, and one of the meals that I had was lasagna, and I found, no matter where I was, the noodles were too long for the pan so that I could crisscross them, which you want to do when you're making lasagna. You, you know, so the noodles are hot, you're burning your fingers, picking them up, and going, gee, I wish this pan was perfectly sized to make lasagna. And that's when I came up with the idea for the Lamagna lasagna baking pan, a 
baking pan perfectly sized to make lasagna. So now the pan needed to be a foot square because I had been around enough to, to see lasagna from Maine to, to Los Angeles, how big the noodles were, the biggest ones were after you boil them a foot square. It needed to be stainless steel because stainless uh, uh, aluminum reacts with tomato sauce and, and creates a toxin. So it needed to be stainless steel. It needed to be tapered because you would stack, when you're shipping the cans, uh, the pans from the factory to where you're going to assemble them and put them into packaging, you don't want to perfectly square because then they stack up high. So if they were tapered, one would fit in the other. And then you need a cover for the pan because you can never eat a square foot of lasagna in one sitting. I don't care how big your family is. And you'd want to save it and put it in the freezer so you put the cover on top. So that was my idea. Lamagna lasagna baking pan. Now, you know, the, the, uh, the lesson is, you know, don't go out and sell a product that you don't have. Make sure you have the product. Now, I just assumed that I could get a pan. So I went out and sold the Lamagna lasagna pan to Globe A1 <coughs> Spaghetti Company in Los Angeles. They made lasagna, so it's natural. And they said, great. You know, so they put a coupon for the Lamagna lasagna pan in their lasagna boxes, and, and off it went. So now I had to get the lasagna pans. So I figured I'd just call up a pan company. Well, we don't make foot square pans nor do we make stainless steel foot square pans. And I couldn't find them anywhere. And finally, I found a company. I said, well, will you make them for them? It was Echo Manufacturing. Yeah, we'll make them for you. But it costs $25,000 for the tooling. And you have to do a run of 5,000 pans, at, and we'll charge you $5 a pan. So that's another $25,000. So now I need $50,000 to do my Lamagna Le lasagna pan thing. It might as well have been a million dollars like my movie. I didn't have $50,000, and I couldn't raise the money. I spent six months trying to raise the money, and it never happened. So I learned, you know, don't do something that you can't do with the money you have or can easily get. I mean, that's the lesson. Tweezer Man, I started with $500. I was able to buy those first tweezers from the guy who, the purchasing director at Apoca Industries, where they were picking them up with capacitors and dyes. I was able to buy, you know, 50 tweezers for, for my $500 or whatever it was. And that's how I started the company. I started it with my own money. The, you know, the, uh, 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 in terms of, of how, how to be, succeed, and the kind of last point I just want to uh, uh, bring up here is, and I'm going to show you this. Uh, I, I like to think of business uh, uh, geometrically. Uh, but I mean, this is perfect, the, the triangle is perfectly equal, is balanced, so each side is the same, and each side meets at each thing. Now, there are three parts of a business, three basic functions of a business. You, have, you make a product or a service, you sell it, and then you control the business. So when you don't have a boss telling you what to do every day, and you wake up every day, you've got to tell you, you've got to make up what you're going to do. And what you want to make sure you don't do is, like, I love, I love accounting, and I love keeping track of stuff. I, I would do that all the time if I was allowed to. But you can't do it all the time. You've got to spend equal amount of time selling your product, working on the product development and the production of it, and on controlling the business. Now, with Tweezer Man, when I first started Tweezer Man, I would spend the first four months of the year selling the product, because that's when the trade shows were happening, and that's when the industry was getting ready for the season. Then during the summer, I would work on the product. And as it kind of got bigger, one of the things I used to do is I'd go to Europe and I'd look for new products or work talk to the factories that are making my tweezers. Or I would figure out a way to increase the uh, uh, buy a machine for the production line. And then at the last four months of the year, I would work on budgeting, I'd do accounting, I would do things that are involved in running the business, like setting up a computer system. So the, if you had $1,000 to spend, you wouldn't spend it all on an ad campaign, which I did once. That's what I did. That's how I ruined Cupid Computer. I mean, it was a success, but what money I had left, I spent all on advertising, and it didn't work, and that was the end of it. I ran out of money, and the business was over. So instead of becoming Match.com, <laughs> I disappeared. The, the, the other thing about this is when I got big and started hiring people, I hired a person who was a sales manager, then I hired a production manager, and then I hired my uh, chief operating officer, which did the control thing. 
So now I had those three people, and then I kind of worked in the middle directing traffic. So the, the point of all this, and, and I get into it more in the book, is that's how you manage yourself, because that's who you answer to. Now, one of, one of the, uh, um, take a breath here, but one of the things that, how are we doing for time? Okay, I'll, I'll make this short and then we'll go to some questions because we, we've been at it for almost an hour now. <laughs> I was worried about 45 minutes. Okay, Here, here's the thing. You want to start a business and your goal is to make a living because once you do that, you're free. Then you don't have to go work for anybody else, okay? Or find someone else who started a business that you work with. Uh, that's the other way to go if you're not the kind of person who thinks you can do it on their own. So... But how do you go from making a living to making retirement money or making a fortune? And the way you do that is you need to delegate. You need to know how to delegate. And you, what, what I would do is I would learn how to do something, and as soon as I figured out how to do it, I would find someone else to do it. For instance, when I was going around to those salons selling those tweezers, it was obvious that all you had to do was show the tweezer. You didn't have to be a, a, a genius. Just take the tweezer and show it. So I then just hired, I started hiring salesmen and salespeople to go around selling tweezers and beauty salons. And then I went back home. Then I hired, then I hired a, 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 my neighbor, the, the girl next door, to answer the phones and do the books. All these things just keep, keep building up people. So now you're hiring people. Now what do you do? You empower them. You empower your people. The people are the most important thing for your success. Your, your employees are the ones who are going to carry you on their shoulders to great success. And if you not exploit them, empower them, there's a big difference. You know, I never paid a minimum wage. I always strove to pay what's called a living wage. There's enough money for my employee to, to, to live so that they could come to work and not be thinking about what they're going to do after work, maybe get another job. Give them health insurance, give them job security. We didn't fire people willy-nilly. In fact, we had a rule at our company where no one person could fire another person without the agreement of a third person so that you didn't have to be terrified of your boss. I, made, I gave profit sharing to the employees. 5% of the profits got distributed to employees, and we had a formula that we took your salary over the total amount of salaries, and that percentage is the percentage of the pool that you got. We involved them in every way. We had what you call... Uh, Quaker-style meetings. If we were to have a Quaker-style meeting now, these chairs would be all around us, and we'd all be looking at each other, and then we'd get up and we'd be able to talk to each other and have a conversation. That's how we had our meetings with my employees. My employees would get up. You weren't allowed to criticize anybody in the meeting. Uh, you, were allowed to, you were allowed to complain, but not about someone else, and give us an idea or, you, or communicate with someone. We had a steering committee that ran the company. Uh, I, I was fanatic about delegating to the point where I even delegated the job of president to someone as soon as I could. And the, the, it's called responsible capitalism. Part of it is when you're empowering your employees and you're rewarding them. I budgeted 20% of the ownership of my company right from the start. This is Tweezer Man to give it to my employees. Not give it to them, but they earn it. You know, you, 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 when we sold Tweezer Man in 2004, I had 200 employees, they owned 20% of the company, and they shared $10 million. They kept their jobs because I had set it up that the acquiring company couldn't lay anyone off, nor move the company, and they got this payout, which was a windfall. I mean, the guy who cleaned the floors got $33,000, and he still had his job. So it's, uh, it's remarkable when the, the, your employees realize that they're owners. And it, it was funny, when I first made the owners, and we had the meeting, a woman raised her hand, and, you know, she's one of my poorer employees, and she said, you know, Ms. Lamagna, I really appreciate you giving me stock, but I really need, I'd rather have a raise than get stock because, I, you know, I have to feed my family and I got expenses and all this. Just didn't get it. They didn't get what it was worth. And I said, well, I'm not giving you a raise. I'm giving you the stock. But then what I did was I taught them how the company worked. We, we stood up there. We had classes. And then every year, I gave them a report about how much their stock was worth. Now, the first year, it was not worth much because I'd just given it to them. But by the second year, they started to see it getting worth more and more. And they all of a sudden, everyone was involved in the company. They were all my partners now. It was amazing. I, I really, after 
After about 15 years of tweezer man, the company was really solid. Uh, let's see, I ran for Congress in 96. Yeah, I was able to walk away from the company and run for Congress in 1996. I started the company in 80 because my employees were there running the company. What I ended up doing the last 10 years, I mean, the company I sold after 25 years, I basically would just hold the culture and be the person who made sure that people were treated right and we were doing the right things. And I pushed the frontier out. By that meaning, like, we needed a new building, so I would be the one to go out and find the building and renovate it. And then after that's all done, then we'd move the company in. But meanwhile, we had president of the company, we had the, the vice president of sales, vice president of production, vice, you know, all that stuff was all other people doing it. That's how you leverage yourself. That's how you build a company that can make you wealthy or, uh, or, or set you up for retirement, is through that principle of empowering your employee. Now, the next step is, you know, when you talk about responsible capitalism, it's your, your enterprise is operating for the benefit of all the stakeholders. And who are the stakeholders? So, for instance, we have our employees. I just told you about them. Then we have the vendors, people selling to us. We have our customers. We have our shareholders. And we have our community. So all those people, the theory is that you take care of all those people, and they'll take care of you. For instance, I, I shouldn't talk against the company that acquired me, but they, they, because they were very good, and they, they continued to practice the best, uh, uh, best practices with my employees. But the very first thing they started doing was attacking the vendors and trying to get the prices down and changing vendors. And we were loyal to our vendors. And I wouldn't change vendors to save a quarter. You know, these are deep relationships. They, they were there for me when I couldn't pay my bills, uh, and they would get, extend me credit. I wasn't going to drop them because somebody else had given me a better, a better price for the same exact product. When you talk about your customers, you know, you, the way you take care of your customers uh, is that you don't sell them a dangerous product. You don't try to exploit them. You give them a, 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 in, in, in our, uh, with our tweezer, uh, we had this policy where we would repair it for life. I mean, all you would have to do is get it to us, and we would resharpen it and get it back to you. And our customers loved that. In fact, that was probably the biggest thing that I did to get word of mouth about my product out. People said, oh my god, I mean, I sent my tweezer and I got it back a day later. It was funny. Some of these tweezers would come in overnight. Now that cost $15. And the tweezer cost $15. I'm thinking, what's going on here? Why don't you just go buy another tweezer? Well, what was going on? They were using their company's shipping room to ship their tweezers to us. And then, you know, when you talk about your community, you know, you give back to your community. We budgeted 5% of our profits that we gave, gave out. And we gave out, and the company agreed who we were going to give that to. Tweezer Man's customers were mostly women. So, for instance, we were famous for funding breast cancer projects. Uh, we put the pink ribbon on our tweezers years ago before it was even in vogue. We probably, you know, uh, you'd see it in a little magazine. And we would give... Uh, uh, a percentage of, of the sales in that product to uh, people who are counseling people who have breast cancer in their family and so on and so forth. So I'm going to uh, kind of close this up now by saying that, you know, first of all, go out there and, and try something. You know, don't be afraid to do it. If you're going to do anything, make sure you fear success and make sure you Set something up that you're going to enjoy doing. That's, that's for sure. Don't just get a partner. Get more than one partner. Uh, uh, keep it simple. Do things with the money you have. Act responsibly. Uh, if, you're, if you're a person who's working for a big company and you're not really interested in going out there, there is something you can do inside a company. You can be an entrepreneur. Uh, Gifford Pinchot, uh, who you saw at in my video, who is the president of Bainbridge Graduate Institute, uh, which is a school that offers MBAs in sustainable business that I fund and uh, I'm on the board of. He wrote this book called Entrepreneurship. And basically what you do as an entrepreneur inside a company is you organize with other employees and you produce something for the company uh, that is a benefit to the company and as a result you increase uh, you know, your, your, your salaries or your, 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 and you create profits for the company. Or something even better that you can do because I'm very big on decentralization, and I think these big companies should, if they're not going to fall apart, too big to fail, my opinion is that they're, they're failing because they're too big, is uh, breaking them up by having people inside a company get together and convince those 
rapacious CEOs who use the companies as their AT machines to sell off a division and get, get outside funding to buy the company from the bigger company. And I think that's possible to do, and, and, I, and I'd like to see it happen, because I do believe bigness doesn't work. Decent bigness work doesn't, doesn't work in general. The Soviet Union proved that. Decentralized, de decentralization, which is pushing, pushing the, the power of decision making as down, as close to the, the bottom as possible, is a way that you know, America is going to come back from this crisis we just went through. So read my book, and I really appreciate you guys for uh, coming here tonight in this bitterly cold weather and uh, listen to me rant. You know, anybody who needs to leave, you know, you're welcome to. But if anybody has any questions, uh, we can go go at it for you know a few minutes. Any question about anything? Maybe a personal question. Yes. Uh, why did I decide to sell a uh, tweezer man? Well, I, as uh, Kevin had uh, told you, I got very politically active uh, from, particularly once the. Uh, the word got out that we were going to go into Iraq. And I was afraid that my fighting the Bush administration could lead to uh, an attack of me by taking out my company. In other words, the word would be, you know, Tweezer Man is a problem. He's using the money that he's making from his company to make anti-Iraq, you know, anti-war films, which I was doing. And and since my employees were owners, I felt it wasn't really fair to them for me to impose my politics on their possible ownership in the company. So that was, that was a background thing that was a concern for me. The other thing that was happening was that we, we operated under the wire uh, and under the radar, uh, in effect, of the big companies. They didn't know what we were doing. We were selling a tweezer for 20 bucks, and we were selling a lot of them. We sold 40 million of those tweezers over 25 years. And uh, they were starting to wake up to the fact that quality grooming tools was a good market mission. So I was starting to see a lot of competition come up. And I was tired of being Tweezer Man. I mean, really, it was 25 years. I never planned to be Tweezer Man. Uh, I, you know, I really wanted to be president. And uh, <laughs> I got cured of that fast, let me tell you. Uh, that, that's the closing story in my book. So uh, I had gone, uh, I'd gone on a trip to India when I came back. If somebody had left a message that they wanted to buy the company, uh, the uh, chairman of uh, chairman, of, the new chairman of the board of Revlon, uh, and uh, so I went for. Let me quickly tell you how that happened. One of the things that you do is you use your money for promotion and advertising. You, the first place you go to is uh, public relations because with a very little money you can get a lot of reach, and I always did that. Uh, I had a budget for promotion, but when I did promotions, they were very unusual promotions. For instance, I, one year I spent $30,000 and I produced a tweezer show where we had tweezerettes singing Hip to Tweez Hair and Stand By Your Tweezer Man and a whole bunch of funny songs at a big convention. And we got on television and it was re very, very effective and it cost me 30 grand and it was terrific. Well, there was this billboard uh, that you had to go under when you went from New York City to uh, LaGuardia Airport. Now, everybody in the industry, in the fashion industry, that comes to New York flies through LaGuardia Airport. So all those buyers, all those people, when they went home, they were going to drive under this billboard, which I saw. So I, hey, I should rent that billboard. Well, that was in 2001, and I called up the guy, and he said, well, I said, how much is the billboard? He said, $30,000 a month. I go, ugh. And, uh, he said, but it doesn't matter because I have a list of 10 people who want it. So I said, all right, well, put my name on the list. Three years later in 2004, we get a call. Our name came up. And that was $40,000 a month. So, but I took it. And I put Tweezer Man up there. Well, a month after I signed our one-year contract to be up there, now understand, 72,000 cars go underneath that also. So it, it, it wasn't that crazy that they'd spent $40,000. An ad in a magazine would cost me 25000 so you know, my company was doing about $30,000 in business by then, so I had a big budget. Well, a 
a month after the board goes up, the Department of Traffic puts up a directional sign right in front of it. So instead of now seeing this thing for you know, 15 seconds, you're lucky if you see it in two seconds. So I called the guy, I said, hey, this is not what I signed up for. And he said, uh, not to worry, I'll, I'll move you around the city. You know, I have let a, a lot of people who want that space, even though there's a directional sign in front of it, I'll move you around the city. So I said, well, I don't want to be moved around the city. You'll put me anywhere. I know where you'll put me. You'll put me behind the wall somewhere. He said, no, no, you pick the location. So I ended up, every month I was in a different location. I was at the entrance to the Midtown Tunnel, the exit to the Midtown Tunnel, the Holland Tunnel. I was on the West Side Highway. Every month I was in a different place. So now this CEO of Revlon is seeing me all over the place. He's going, who is Tweezer Man? He says to his uh, head of Revlon Implements. Now, Revlon was the biggest implement company out there. They were doing $50 million in implement sales. Uh, her name was Lisa. She says, who's Tweezer Man? He's the f it's the finest eyebrow tweezer in the world. <laughs> and he goes, well, should we buy them? She says, if you can. So then they contacted me. So that started a process which was too good to pass up given what I had told you that I was concerned about my politicking and, and the company had reached a point. Any other questions?